Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here today. This is the fourth program in our series. I'm Marge Zunder. I'm a new member of the Central Vermont OLLI Committee. And We're very happy to have her. <laughs> it is my honor to introduce today's speaker. Um, Dr. Tony D'Amato has a wealth of information on trees for us. Can you hear me okay? Better when you get up Better when I'm up He is professor of silviculture and applied, science, applied forest ecology and the director of the forestry program at the University of Vermont. He has also been a faculty member at the University of Minnesota and the Bullard Fellow at Harvard University. His re research at UVM focuses on long-term forest dynamics. Professor D'Amato. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Marge. And I'm gonna try to get this to the, my height. Yeah, if people can hear me okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it off. I tend, to, I tend to move around, so people hearing all right. Um, so yeah, thanks for the invitation, uh, and certainly thanks for the interest in this topic. And, and so what I'm hoping to do today, I recognize there's a, a wide range of backgrounds in the room. Many of you already have a good appreciation just for how vegetation has historically moved around in response to changing climate. And, and really the goal today is to talk a bit about both what we know about the history of Vermont's forests in terms of how trees have moved in the past, and then how we're thinking about possibly moving trees in the future, dealing with some of the challenges that are facing Vermont's forests and really more broadly, um, the, the globe's forest today. So a lot of, oops, that didn't go very well. Uh, a lot of what's on our mind these days uh, are, very novel changes that are happening both uh, environmentally, or what's, uh, is that we just a connection thing? Um, as well as I'm um, happening with other dynamics happening in the region. And so obviously I don't need to talk to my, for those of you in Montpelier about um, both what we're getting for last year, not enough rain, this year way more rain than we ever wanted. Um, and really, you know, we've, we've ironically had part of this year, um, four years in a row that we consider a drought. And so um, as a region, we're certainly seeing some pretty dramatic changes. Again, don't need to belabor that in this room. But beyond that, there's things like spongy moth here in New Hampshire, that southern pine beetle on Long Island, um, beech bark disease, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, hemlock woolly adelgid, all these things that are affecting forests in, in ways that really there isn't a historic analog for. And so it makes many of us concerned about what the future of the region's forests might look like, and importantly, um, our ability to sustain all those values that we get from forests, both aesthetics, ecological, cultural, um, as well as certainly economic. And so there's been a lot of discussion about how do we deal with this change um, and should we, as, as, as kind of human parts of that ecosystem, be doing something actively to address that change. And so what I'm showing here is just a few uh, headlines from the New York Times and Washington Post, as well as Nature Magazine, over the past several years talking about um, things going on in Minnesota. Is this like maybe the connection up here or not? Anyway, we can, we can be patient with it, not a big deal. Um, so are we trying to plant the forest of the future? Can we help trees outrun climate change? Um, can we figure out ways to move trees around? So there's a lot, a lot of discussion um, broadly, not just in the Northeast, about how do we respond to these changes and, and should we actually be actively doing things about it? And so I recognize that that was probably the main prompt to get me to come here today was there's some articles on some of the work we've been doing about potentially moving trees around in response to climate change. And I'll certainly talk about that today, but what I, what I first wanna do is just provide some historical context, which again, um, might give you some, 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 some PTSD to your old biology class, and they talked about glacial geology and things like that, but just to, to discuss that, you know, trees have moved, they've always been moving, um, and, and how, do we, how does that compare to what we're seeing today? So what I'm gonna do is give a bit of a historical context on tree movement and migration, particularly with New England as the focus, and a lot of what this information comes from are uh, what we call paleoecology. And so again, some of you are very, very familiar with this, but what you're seeing on the right-hand side here, these are um, sediment cores from, from ponds or, or lakes or even sometimes small hollows in the woods. And what people will do is, is just from, through stratigraphy, so the, the, the higher up on the core, the younger the sediment was laid down, so the deeper you go, the further back in time you go. And then what they can do is age each layer and then, then actually identify the pollen grains, which you're looking at here, in each layer to understand what was the vegetation at that point in time in that location um, in Vermont or elsewhere. And so it's a really useful tool to historically look back and understand just how vegetation has been changing. 
So a lot of what we talk about when we are thinking about vegetation change is, is how it responded to the last big environmental change in the Northeast. And that really is how forests were responding to the retreat of the Laurentian ice sheet. So as most of us appreciate, you know, over 20,000 years ago, we'd have over a mile of ice above us right now here in Montpelier. And so what we want to understand historically, as that climate was changing, as that ice was receding, here's an active uh, glacier receding in, in Alaska, first thing colonizing that landscape is, is alder. And so understanding over time, how did species both colonize, move, and importantly, what did that reflect in terms of the environment and what can that, that tell us? So as a simple example, um, this is just showing spruce species uh, in Eastern North America. So here's some spruce pollen grains. Um, I always thought paleoecology was, was really cool. I loved the graphs. And then what I found out is you just like take one course or one day of field work and the rest of your time is just staring at pollen grains. <laughs> so so I, I, got, I, I do other things uh, in the woods instead, but, um, but they really produce some cool, cool diagrams and cool information. And so here's the Laurentian ice sheet 21,000 years ago. Again, um, where we are, I would have been under ice. And this is where spruce was, uh, the abundance of spruce species. So percentage within these pollen diagrams um, back in that time period. And so most of the spruce was located um, in the central Appalachian region. And if we look at spruce today, um, with obviously no longer an ice sheet, um, the, the majority of spruce, kind of the most abundant spruce, is what we were getting quite a bit of smoke from, um, in both in past, past summers as well as um, this summer, uh, up into the boreal region of Canada. And so giving you a feel for just kind of over that 20,000 year period, spruce has really moved quite a bit across, across that landscape. So what I want to do is provide kind of a, a, just a little bit of a chronology as to what we, we know in terms of Vermont's forests and which species showed up when, and then we can talk a little bit about um, what does that tell us in terms of if we can just rely on natural species movement to start tracking these changes that we're seeing um, in the environment. So what I'm going to do is rely on a series of, of, of maps on the right-hand side that basically um, are coded for different species. And so I'll start in the top left-hand corner and work, work my way down to the most recent, um, close to recent, a time period, a thousand years before present. And, and what I'm gonna do is just go through, and again, many of you are already familiar with this general progression of vegetation as it moved into the Northeastern United States following the last glaciation. And so what we recognize is the first species, these S's are spruce. And so in 14,000 years ago, if you were to be spending time I'm in Massachusetts, Cape Cod even, um, the species that would be dominating those forests were spruce, primarily white spruce and black spruce, which would be similar to if you went to northern Alaska today, same idea, right? Latitudinal tree line as we get, get further north. As the climate continued to warm, we started to see white pine showing up, and so this is what things would have looked like 10,000 years before present. So white pine, this is a, a sample that happened up in Victory Bog that they used to reconstruct things. So white pine was starting to show up in those pine pollen diagrams. 6,000 years ago, hemlock really became quite abundant in our region. And then the most recent arrivals to our region are largely hickories and oaks and some of those species we associate more with warm environments. So if you were to move just south into Connecticut, certainly further south into Pennsylvania and the central Appalachians. And so it really took a long time for those species to ultimately uh, make, it, make it into our region. So when people talk about oak in particular, they, they actually say that that species moved a lot faster than they would have expected um, it, if it just naturally was dispersed. Does anybody know kind of what's often talked about is why oaks might have moved more quickly? Anybody ever heard the, the general uh, legend of why oaks might have moved faster? Blue jays. Blue jays, exactly. And, and I had always been told that and always thought that, but the more that I've learned about just the history of our region, I know, the cruel professor trick, right? Um, <laughs> the question is, does the blue jay get a little bit too much credit? And, and the reason I bring that up is those that are familiar with the indigenous cultures really throughout the range of any oak species, um, oak is a central staple of the diets of people. Um, and importantly, um, the Haudenosaunee people, the Abenaki people, Oftentimes, some of the legends of those people are often were called the forest gardeners. As they would move into areas, many of these plants would follow them um, because they were very critical to their, to their cultures. And so here's a picture from California of a tribal member with a, a basket of oaks. Here's uh, some folks from the Seneca Huron clan actually knocking down chestnuts, um, butternut trees. All of these, these, these mass species were, are, criti are still critical to this day um, for, for indigenous cultures. And so oftentimes when we look at kind of where there were Native American settlements in, in North America, we often find that the species got there a lot faster because there was trade. There was actually value in encouraging those species in those areas. So blue jays are important, but not quite as important as 
as, as the people that were moving them around. Could you back up one? Yeah. Oops. The map of 10,000 years back shows quite a bit of what in southern New England. Is that because it was the longest? Yeah, so that was a warmer, warmer area there, yep. And also, you were starting to pick up settlements uh, in, in that region. Yep, so definitely kind of tracking that, that, that temperature. So just to kind of, not to totally to throw, throw too much of a wet bank, blanket on the Blue Jay, I just want to show a little bit more about how we know that there's a pretty st strong human connection to migration beyond just the, the natural. So the map on the left um, is some work that was kind of, that shows in 1500 to 1700, um, known locations of indigenous settlements, as well as the gray areas are just where we also know there was indigenous populations in the northeastern U.S. And, and, and what, they, what they did was evaluate, relative to where those locations were, um, the abundance of different species, and would they expect to see those species there um, just by climate alone. So on the graph on the right is just showing the distance from an actual settlement and the abundance of different species, the upper graph being what we call pyrophilic, so species dependent on fire, so those of us I think I already know that the indigenous burning is very, was a very important cultural practice. But the next line down deals with species that are actually mast producing, so actually produce large nuts. And in particular, the abundance of oak is far more abundant when you're close to a settlement than as you move away. And so those species are actually being preferentially favored, and in many cases actually moved into those areas um, given their importance. And so it's worth just pointing that out as we talk about moving species today. Oftentimes there's this notion, well, how could you think it's a good idea to move species? We've been doing that for a long time. Obviously the intent was very different um, 3,000 years ago, but nonetheless there's been a lot of human movement of plants for a long time um, in North America. So what I, I want to do is provide just some context for tree migration today. And so if we're going to see um, climate change occurring, um, first off, are we actually observing um, those changes? And, and then if we're not seeing those changes happening naturally with climate, what might we do about that? But as you all appreciate, when we think about Vermont's current forests, um, it's often worth reflecting on the fact that they're already recovering some, some, some pretty dramatic changes that have happened really over the last couple of centuries. So this map shows, and many of you may have seen this map before, um, it's percent, oops, forest cover uh, on the, on the y-axis here. Then with, with time, um, I'm not a huge fan of this because it actually shows there wasn't much of a population of people, there wasn't much of a population of European settlers in 1600, but again, there were large populations, you know, well over 20,000 indigenous people even in Vermont during that time period in different locations. But what we can see pretty clearly, all six New England states, um, almost 90% forested in 1600. Um, by the mid 1800s, amazingly, um, some, in some cases, you know, less than 30% forested. So pretty, pretty dramatic transformation. What I think is, is also should be celebrated is just how resilient that forest has been. So recovering um, to really what we kind of now view as a bit of a high water mark of around 77% forested in Vermont. Um, but I'll also point out that um, we're now seeing these lines go down again uh, for the first time in a century. So Vermont is losing forest land, which is, which is not something to be celebrated at all. We're, we're losing forest to conversion to other uses. Uh, it's not forest harvesting, it's actually forest conversion to something else. And so um, it's certainly something the state needs to, and others need to grapple with, you know, do we, do we think about um, the best way to, for smart growth to minimize that? We're not gonna talk about that too much more today, but all, the reason I'm bringing this up is that our forests are relatively quite young and certainly um, been altered quite a bit. So what we can do is look at the time period that Europeans were first really moving into the region and carving things up into towns and carving things up into states as a way to get a better understanding of what that forest, all that migration, all that movement of trees, what did that look like in the, in the, in the early to mid 1700s? And so uh, some of you are already familiar with this work, but Charlie Cogville, who lives in Plainfield, Vermont, but is an amazing historical ecologist, um, has done a lot of work really deciphering what the forest of Vermont looked like at the time that European settlement was really um, advancing. So the map on the left um, shows all of the historic towns that were being laid out by the royal surveyors um, in the 1700s. And so you'll notice um, states like Vermont, um, New York, um, kind of have a fairly regular pattern, but, but other states, depending on how they were laying things out, um, some of the towns take on pretty large, large shapes. I think that's Plymouth, uh, one of the largest towns in Massachusetts. You'll also notice northern, New he northern Maine has a very regular grid pattern. And so the history of surveying land in the US it wasn't until the General Land Office was actually established in the early 1800s that we had a, a unified way of surveying land, the public land survey approach, um, with townships and ranges. Those of you that may have hailed from the Midwest or 
ever go out there and look at maps. Very different way of laying things out. So it's much more systematic. And so um, the point being is that these towns are being laid out, and when they laid the towns out, the surveyors would actually record what species they were seeing at each corner that they were laying the towns out. So it's a really nice, nice historic source of what trees, tree species look like. So I'm going to zoom in on north central Vermont um, and, and just let's look at what tree species were most abundant um, in north central Vermont um, at the time of, of, of major European settlement across the region. And so this maroon color is the one you're seeing a lot of, um, and that's American beech, um, really, really the most abundant species um, in that pre-colonial forest. You'll also notice really nicely that the Northeast Kingdom, um, you're seeing a lot more dark green, so that spruce and fir, so really reflecting kind of the importance of those species across that landscape. And in a very different looking forest than, than what we have today, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll show a slide of that in a second. Any thoughts on, on why beech would be the most abundant species? Any, any thinking on that? Why, why, why that one, like the surveyors would record that one most often? Absolutely. So very important species for, for especially black bear, um, but other species. So, so and very common. Um, so certainly one, just a big part of our forest naturally. It's one of the species we associate with old growth or late successional forests. So these would have been areas. And then the last piece is just, I know not, nobody in this room's ever carved their initials into a beach. Um, but if you were to scribe on a corner post as a surveyor, it's a really good tree to kind of mark, right? Because you could basically say this is plot corner five with a, with a knife. And that's at that last on the tree. So it's a little bit of a bias to beach um, because it's a good tree to kind of put your mark on um, when you're surveying. But nevertheless, if we. So it's a really important. Uh, so beach, uh, beach nuts are an extremely important part of the bear, of black bear's diet. And actually, not to get too into the weeds on it, but um, the female black bears, if they don't have enough fat content when they go. Um, and hibernation, um, the, the embryo won't implant in terms of it for, for it to have cubs. And so being fat on beech nuts is a huge, important part of, the, of, of, of what, what bears do. And so we really rely on beech um, a lot um, as, a, as a source of food for, for, for bears naturally out in the woods. So I'm going to look at our current forest. So this is the same, same map. And now we're using current measurements of trees. And I'm going to zoom in on, on the modern forest. And, and, and for those that can differentiate um, reds, we'll see pretty clearly that that maple is now the most abundant tree species in Vermont. It's great for our fall foliage. It's great for our syrup industry. Um, but, but really, it reflects that the forest has been shifted a bit you know, away from that, that strong beech dominance, particularly beech is a, is a large tree. Um, and so now we have an ecosystem that, that's been changed. And so the reason I'm showing this is that when we think about this forest now responding to climate change and all these other changes, it's already kind of been homogenized and altered a bit from our intensive land use. And so now we want to observe, you know, is it actually, how is it going to respond and are we going to see some, some shifts in that ecosystem over time? So I'm going to go through a couple of studies that have occurred that have just looked at are tree species actually moving now, right? We know that Vermont is having milder winters. We're getting drier. I know it's a weird season to say that this is an anomaly compared to what we've been having the past several years. Drier, warmer. Are we seeing actual tree species migration in response to that? So this is some work that was done uh, at a Purdue University looking at 86 tree species in the eastern United States and evaluating over the last three decades, have we seen seedlings from those trees actually moving further than their parents are? So are we now finding those trees in new places that they weren't um, you know, prior to this measurement? And so what these arrows indicate are just the movement of some tree species. You can see that a lot of those arrows are going west. And so what they found is about 73% of the tree species they evaluated have shown kind of a, a westward migration over the last three decades. And so if we think about kind of the western edge of the eastern forest, it gets, becomes very oak dominated. We also have a lot of areas that are agricultural, and so uh, trees are kind of colonizing a lot of those areas. And it's drier, and so those species like oak are now kind of moving and tracking that changing climate. There's also been some movement northward. That's kind of what we expect. 63% of the tree species actually kind of have been shifting northward. So we're seeing some movement of trees. But the question is, are those trees moving fast enough? Right? Do they, do, are they actually going as fast as climate is uh, changing? So to put this in perspective, following the glacier, they estimate that most tree species traveled about a tenth to three tenths of a mile per year. That's kind of how fast they could move. And so if we look at current climate change, trees would have to go as fast as four to six miles per, per year to actually track that, right? So 
So trees can't move as fast as climate's changing. This is a map just showing the velocity of climate change. So in some places, a tree would have to move over 100 miles per year to actually get as get, go as fast as climate is changing in that area. And so there's a lot of concern about, over time, if trees can't move to where the climate becomes suitable for them, and at the same time, the places where climate's changing, those trees currently there are declining, are we gonna have some unintended consequences in terms of what's happening in those ecosystems? And so this is oftentimes the, the impetus for thinking about moving. But before I end on that negative note and get into more ac action, I wanna have a positive story of tree species migration in Vermont that I think um, is, 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 is why this is not as simple as just looking at climate. There's a lot going on there. So there are some shifts that can happen, not just with latitude and longitude, but also we think about a state like Vermont, there can be things that might actually happen um, with elevation. We might see changes with elevation as, as climate changes. And so one of the areas that people have been interested in is that, as we all know, um, we have this really neat transition zone in our forest between hardwood dominated, typically northern hardwood forests at lower elevations, to more spruce and fir dominated forests at high elevations. And in between those, we have what we call an ecotone, which is essentially just a transition zone between those two ecosystems. And so with climate change, 99 out of 100 scientists and others would say the expectation is that these spruce and fir, it's gonna be harder and harder to be at lower elevations because they get warmer and warmer and so that's, that, that line is gonna start receding. At the same time, this maple is gonna be going up slope, kind of moving into, into, into more favorable environments. So we were interested in looking at this and, and what's been happening over the last several decades in terms of where is the location of this boundary? Are we seeing it go down slope or are we seeing this boundary go up slope? And again, most would predict that would go down slope. Sorry, up slope. And so what we did is evaluate all the areas in blue within the Green Mountain National Forest and all the areas in blue within the, the White Mountains um, and evaluate over the last three decades what has been the direction of movement. Are, are trees going down slope or are trees going up slope? And so this is a graph just showing the distribution of kind of the average location of that lower edge. And what we generally found is that actually spruce are going down slope. They're actually going the exact opposite of everything you would predict. Things are actually moving down slope. It's not a tremendous rate, it's about four to five feet per year, but the general trend is, is things are moving down slope. So whenever that occurs, you're, you're, you have many reasons you throw at the wall um, to, to think it through, but this one actually is pretty, pretty clear just knowing that the land use history of Vermont and more broadly the land use history of, of the Northeast. And in particular, um, anyone that's really followed the history of logging um, in the Northeast knows that there was a time period where, where spruce was, was heavily persecuted from our forests. Um, and in particular, when we, before we had railroads to move wood, um, water was the way to move, you move wood. And so if it floated, um, it was a much more valuable species. So our wonderful sugar maple veneer, that's gonna sink to the bottom of a stream, right? So it really was that spruce that was quite important. I'm from Massachusetts. I never fully knew why Holyoke was called Paper City. There's not any spruce around Holyoke but the Connecticut River flows right into it, and that was a source of spruce logs. Uh, Mount Tom, uh, there's a big mill down there for spruce. All that was coming out of Vermont, New Hampshire, being floated down these mills. And this is a picture of the last big log drive um, near Bellows Falls, Vermont. Um, you could walk across the Connecticut on logs. This is all spruce. And so what was happening, if I go back a couple slides, is when we look at the mountains, and oftentimes we'll see this pretty linear line between the hardwoods and the spruce, and so they were basically going up slope cutting all that spruce out of the hardwood and kind of artificially pushing that, that elevation upwards just via land use. And so what's been happening over the last several decades, if not centuries, is that spruce is starting to recover. Both those small spruce they left behind now are big enough to cast seed. Anybody that kind of hikes up in the mountains or, or, or think, remembers times going up a, a chairlift, you often see spruce just down slope from a mature tree that basically is the seedlings coming off of that individual. So we're seeing this, this recovery um, both due to just the maturation of the seed source, but also um, because of the Clean Air Act. Um, spruce is very sensitive to acid deposition, and so we're seeing a lot of recovery of that species um, due to just, just better air quality. Um, at the same time, we're seeing additional stress on some of the hardwood species it's with, so, so a lot going on there. But, but a generally a positive story uh, of migration, kind of going the opposite of what we think with climate change. So I'm gonna get to now talking about if we can't solely rely on trees sprinting as fast as climate change, um, do we actually think about like moving trees and planting for change in the future? And so um, what, what often catches a lot of people's attention in terms of 
you know, what are you doing out in the woods and, you know, why you're planting that and where, where is that coming from? Um, a lot of that's just is planting for change and thinking about can we anticipate that? So again, just for context, um, this is a map of average drought tolerance of, of trees in the U.S. With, with red being low tolerance of drought. So our current forests um, are very mesic, very well adapted to wet conditions. So as we see more and more dry periods, um, there's some concern about the future of our forests. Likewise, this map in the middle um, essentially view this as if you could see like future new perennials in your zone. Um, there's a lot of work that's looked at kind of the potential for new tree species in the Northeast if they could just run there as fast as they could. And you'll notice that estimates suggest up to 20 new tree species could find habitat in this region um, over the next 100 years just based on, on climate change projections. And then finally, um, just to remind you, we're talking about climate a lot, but a lot of my work deals not just with climate change, but also um, this, this tremendous density of non-native insects and diseases in our region. Again, I tip my hat to growing, growing up in Massachusetts. Um, I have a youth of squashing spongy moths, um, you know, in, in the early, early 80s outbreaks. Um, now we talk about it in Vermont because it's been an issue in, in Chittenden County, but that's just one of many non-native insects and diseases we're dealing with. And sadly, um, we gain usually one new, even non-native wood borer per every five years. There's just something new coming every, every even beech leaf disease is a new one we're talking about. So a lot, a lot going on there. So I work in forestry and forest conservation. So when, we, when we're talking about forest management, one of our main areas of emphasis is that if I'm gonna do a harvest like was done in the foreground here in the White Mountain National Forest, um, I'm really trying to make sure I'm getting good regeneration back, you know, new, new seedlings. And so in our part of the country, we really rely heavily on just natural seedlings coming back. It's really, we're really fortunate. We don't talk much about planting at all. Really the last big planting efforts with the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 30s. Really, we really, we don't think about um, planting. And just to put that in context, so Maine obviously is our biggest player in the region in terms of forest management activities. Um, 5,000 acres of, of forest in Maine in 2019 were planted. That's 4% of all of their regeneration activity. Really, they're relying likewise on spruce and fir. This 4% actually is uh, J.D. Irving up in Northern Maine. We do a lot of plantations up there, but not, not much else. But what we've been seeing both in terms of Philanthropy, so there's the Trillion Tree Project, the Nature Conservancy, others, they want to plant, plant forests. In general, we're seeing just a lot of interest in Vermont and more broadly in the Northeast of people wanting to plant more. And so this is just a survey of a small number of foresters, 42, and over 90% are saying we're going to plant more over the next several years. We are, we are anticipating planting. So why is it they think they're going to be planting? So we asked them, um, and kind of the main core reasons are to diversify the current forest. So just a good precautionary principle, things are changing, having more diverse forests is a good thing. But two of the other main reasons are to adapt to future climate and to adapt to future disturbance. So trying to think about providing potential species out there that might be um, able to do better under these changing conditions that are affecting our ecosystems. So what I'm gonna talk about and, and give you a little bit of a, a background on is just this whole notion of what we call assisted migration, right? So basically the active movement of a tree species into an area in response to anticipating change that might imp impact either the current ecosystem um, or in some cases trying to move a species into an area where it might find more suitable habitat. So there's three kind of flavors of assisted migration we talk about in forest adaptation. So forest adaptation being kind of active management, trying to adapt um, the ecosystem and kind of our expectations of those systems. And so one of these is what we call assisted population expansion. And so this one I view as kind of the least controversial. What we're doing is largely moving a species a very short distance within its current range. So we're not kind of going north of where it currently is, we're kind of moving it within its, its current distribution. The next one, assisted range expansion, as the name implies, we're actually moving that species beyond its current range and essentially moving it to where you would expect it to be if it could just sprint as fast as climate was changing. So we know this spot right here is now gonna be suitable for that species, but there's no way it can get there based on just the natural movement across that landscape. And the final piece is, the, is a very controversial one, one we don't do very much of uh, in forestry, but assisted species migration. We did a lot of this historically, Scots pine, Norway spruce, all of the no Norway maple, you know, bringing species from other countries and planting them here or, or, or moving things long distances. So this really, this really involves kind of large distance movement from outside of a species current range to a, to a new, new region. 
And, and basically, this is often talked about mostly with kind of rescuing species that might be imperiled in their current range and moving them to new regions, and, and definitely can be, um, you know, quite quite controversial. You just don't know how well it's going to do in a very novel environment. So I'm going to show a diagram just to, to kind of reinforce what I'm talking about here. And so again, on the left hand side, this is assisted population expansion. So the green is the current range of this tree species. And so what we're doing is, is just kind of moving that species within its current range. And in many cases, often increasing the representation of that species in areas where it might be a minor component. So red oak is a great example for the Northeast. You know, we don't think of red oak being a big part of Vermont's forest, but it's out there, you know, in small amounts. But based on future climate change, most suspect it's going to really have a lot of suitable habitat. So we might actually plant that or augment the population. Here's assisted range expansion. So just north of that current species range, planting that species, and then again, um, assisted species migration, we're really moving that species quite a, quite a, quite a long distance across, across the, the landscape. So we've been doing a lot of research um, in Vermont, in New York, in New Hampshire, as well as uh, we also have a lot of work going on in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, looking at what does this actually kind of play out on a landscape in terms of both how do managers think about integrating this into what they normally do, and importantly, um, how do you actually pull this off, and, and is it successful? Do you actually see you know, species doing better or not, depending on, on where they're from and, and where we move them to? And so I think a key thing to remember is that when we're choosing a species to actually move into an area, there's some key considerations. If our goal with adaptation, we're trying to you know, basically respond to changing climate, changing disturbance regimes, and the reason we're responding is that we are concerned that the many values we get from the forest today are going to be impacted by climate or other, other stressors. And so we want to find ways to still sustain those functions even in a changing environment. And so we just talked about the value of American beach um, to black bear. And so if American beach really does suffer from this new disease, beach leaf disease, which does not seem like a very good thing um, that's, that's starting to move into the Northeast and we're, and we're threatened with a loss of beach, one adaptation strategy might be to plant species like oak that also produce a large nut that would serve as a very important food source for, for black bear. So kind of similar ecological functions. Likewise, um, similar cultural values. So there's no substitute culturally for a species, but there might be some aspects of a different species that could still be used for cultural traditions. So um, black ash with basket making. If you lose black ash, are there other species that you can still derive materials from to make, to make traditional baskets or other, other uses? So white oak being an example for that. And then importantly, if you're going to plant the species, it's important to consider, is it actually going to be adapted to the future? You know, are, we, are we planting something that we, we already have a sense for is going to be stressed by, by climate change? So how do we make this decision? We're really lucky to have sustained investment in federal research um, around a tool known as the Climate Change Tree Atlas. Um, if you Google it after the talk or even now if you're tired of listening to me and want to look at that instead, um, the Climate Change Tree Atlas uh, is a really great uh, tool that the U.S. Forest Service has been producing over, over the, the last decade. And one of the things that the Climate Change Tree Atlas does, again, just to put this into more kind of like gardening speak, it's similar to generating kind of new zone maps for species. You know, where, where might we find that species? Is this spot now a zone four, zone three? I guess we go the other way, zone six. Um, and, and so it's a way to see like where that species might find suitable habitat. But what it also does is generate some projections of where might that species migrate to on its own under climate change, and where might that species actually have suitable habitat in the future, but it's probably not going to get there on its own. And that's kind of the, the, the spot that we look at. And so this map on the left is for, for uh, white oak. And so anywhere on this map that's magenta, white oak already is there, right? So we don't need to really think about kind of movement of that species to those sites. And then anywhere on this map that's dark blue, they expect we'll have suitable habitat for oak in the future under climate change, and it's highly likely that oak will get there on its own. And it's like a no duh, right? It's, in, it's already here in pink, it's gonna get to the dark blue. But if you look at a spot like north central Vermont, this lighter blue suggests that the climate's gonna be suitable for white oak over the next 50 years there, but there's no way it's gonna be able to get there fast enough to actually establish. And so those are the spots that we might look at and say, hey, you know, th that could be a place where we consider um, possibly planting some white oak to see if that can be kind of a, a part of that future forest. So we've been looking at kind of how managers um, that do forest stewardship in the region have been, been can kind of integrating this idea of assisted migration um, into their management. And this graph is just kind of summarizing 
kind of main reasons. So anything with blue or gray, um, sorry, group, group, anything in blue suggests that they're, they're, they're interested or they're already doing it. And so the, the most common type of planting with assisted migration currently happening is to restore what we call keystone species. So American chestnut, American elm, species that were historically quite important, even red spruce, to try to bring them back to the landscape and restore them out in the ecosystem. This idea of a replacement species, the next most common thing, so what they're talking about there is they know a species might be lost due to an insect or disease, and can we actually plant another species that might serve similar functions in that ecosystem to keep that forest functioning a similar way. As you'll notice, they start getting into assisted population expansion, assisted range expansion. Those tend to be the last kind of most common things, but very few foresters are talking about doing like this, this really long distance transfer. It's much more around these ecological values. And so what I'm gonna do to kind of to, to, to transition toward the end here is just show what we've been doing, kind of the species we often are planting um, and the work that we do. And so much of the research we do is in primarily northern hardwood ecosystems, again, in places like Corinth, Vermont, uh, northern Coas County, um, New Hampshire, uh, Wilkett, Vermont, other places. And, and what we're doing there is both evaluating both how these species perform over time, but also what are, what, are they, what are those species doing in terms of trying to sustain those values on that site? And so, well, we've been looking at other species besides this list, but I'm just gonna talk about this, this group because they're, they're the primary ones we've worked with. So big tooth aspen, black cherry, eastern hemlock, red oak, red spruce, white pine, bitternut hickory, black birch or sweet birch, and then American chestnut. And so most of what we do is this flavor, this, this assisted population enrichment, really trying to represent the representation of a species that will likely gain more suitable habitat in that region in the future, uh, but we're not moving it outside of its range. But there are three species that we work with, bitternut hickory, black birch, and American chestnut, where we're actually moving those species just to the north of where they currently are, kind of is, you know, anticipating that, that change. So what have we been seeing over the last seven years of doing this work in terms of outcomes? Um, if you don't want to look at the graphs, just look at this, this, this summary here. But this graph is showing survival, so how well are those, those species surviving versus growth. Um, and there's often a trade-off there for, for trees. And so it's ordered from big tooth aspen to red oak. And so big tooth aspen is our, definitely our fastest grower. Those of you who know aspens, it's pretty amazing what they can do. But aspens also had our lowest survival rate. On the flip side, red oak, kind of slow and steady as a species, but its survivorship has actually been quite high. And so if we look at kind of the collective combination of those two, um, white pine, red spruce, big tooth aspen, those tend to be the species doing best. Um, red oak, eastern hemlock as well as part of that group. And all these are shaded green because these are all species that we're not really moving that far. They're kind of just being kind of enriched in an area. So um, pointing to that risk of possibly moving some of these other species across the landscape. One of the challenges for planting in general is that certain species we don't have great local seed sources for. And so American chestnut, um, the trees that we're planting um, are part of the American Chestnut Foundation's breeding program. So they're trying to breed resistance to chestnut blight. Um, and so these trees actually are 92% American chestnut, 8% Chinese chestnut. So that Chinese chestnut component is trying to give it resistance to that disease that, that wiped it out. And the parent trees are from Virginia because we just don't have any big mature seed bearing chestnut up in northern, northern New England, right? We basically lost so many of those. We don't have an opportunity to, to, to work with seed from those. And so what we find is that when we plant those in places like northern Coas County, um, one of the biggest issues is that we get a lot of this winter injury, right? They're surviving, but they're just not cold hardy um, on the site. And so part of our challenge is just trying to find um, the right seedlings um, that, that it might be more close to the climate we're trying to, to plant into. So these, these final graphs um, are just showing kind of what we're seeing so far in terms of survival and growth and in terms of species that are being just enriched within their range versus species that are actually moving northward. And you'll see generally survival is higher um, with population enrichment as well as growth is higher um, between those two populations. And what this really speaks to is that a lot of the changes that we're anticipating and a lot of the shifts in species um, ranges that are expected to occur really are, are projected for like 50 years from now, right? So we're planting today for a change that might not fully manifest itself in the future. And I, and I hope it's a hard, cold winter. I like when it still feels like Vermont, but if I'm planting a tree that's actually gonna be better adapted to Vermont's winters in 50 years, Right, right now, it might not do well um, in our environment. So there are different things that certainly create issues. Nonetheless, a lot of how we look at this, and if anybody in the room ever did dabble in forestry, um, this would be viewed largely as a failure. Survival rates of that low, you know, normally when we're doing reforestation, we're talking about 
85, 90% is kind of what we're looking for. But with this type of planting, really what we're looking for is that even if 10% of the bitternut hickory we planted today survives to 50 years from now, what that now represents in that region is a seed source for a species that's gonna be far better adapted to that spot than the current forest. And so we're really, really thinking more about kind of enhancing that potential for adaptation in the future as opposed to um, you know, just trying to re reforest with these new mixes of species. So the last thing I'll mention um, to, to, to end is that planting trees is, is, is not as simple as all the kind of, again, trillion tree, billion tree initiatives, all the things we hear about, you know, we can plant, you know, plant our way out of climate change. Um, there are some pretty significant logistical hurdles that we learned out the hard way because we're, I think we're the only people that are really trying to plant a lot of trees right now um, in, in, at the scales we do for our research. And that is, um, we don't have much for, for nurseries. Anybody know where the State Nursery of Vermont used to be? There used to be a nursery that grew seedlings, you could buy seedlings. Uh, anybody know what town that's in? Essex, awesome, yeah. So the Essex, where the, where the soccer, there's a soccer field plus the Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, State of Maine closed their nursery in 1988. Massachusetts, H.O. Cook State Forest, that was their nursery. The only New England state that still has a nursery is New Hampshire, and thank goodness we still have that nursery. We buy a lot of seedlings from them. But generally, we do not have a lot of places you can buy trees from. This is not just a, a Vermont or New England thing. It's a, it's a nationwide thing. Um, they just do not have enough seedlings to go on the landscape. And so what we've been doing is trying to understand you know, what is actually out there for us to plant. And so this map here, the first thing I want to point out are all, all these little delineations. Um, those are different seed zones, right? Again, think of that as kind of if I wanted to plant for a certain hardiness zone, same idea. And this is for red oak. And, and, and so anything that has any shade of, of green in it, you can actually buy seedlings from that zone. Um, so if I really wanted to be intelligent with my assisted migration, which obviously I haven't been, and I was gonna plant in you know, Corinth, Vermont, the most logical source for red oak would actually be from this seed zone, right? The, just south of it. I, I, wanna, I still want red oak, I don't, and I, I want oak that is maybe a little bit more warm adapted, but it's not a huge, huge move for that species. But really the only source I can get oak seed from that's close by is, is, is from this county as well as in this part of New Hampshire. And so we really are currently um, underserved in terms of the ability to actually pull this off in an intelligent way. And so um, again, I, I recognize it's only my Google News feed that gets these, these updates, but you know, six months ago, the, the president actually, there was a significant amount of money invested in nurseries in the US. There, this is a huge problem. Um, and so the state of New Hampshire's nursery got about a quarter million dollars, which largely was enough to kind of um, update what they had from 20 years ago in terms of their capacity. And so um, if we really want to pull this off, um, we're going to need a lot more investment in both nurseries, but nurseries that are producing species that represent diverse ecological functions. I think we can all guess what the CCC had at their, at their disposal in the 30s, red pine, Norway spruce. We see it all the time now in our landscape, and that probably wasn't the best ecological decision um, to plant then. And so trying to build this capacity um, is a key piece. So to wrap up, um, I think we all appreciate, uh, unfortunately, whether it's geopolitically or ecologically, um, we are definitely in a, in a time of, of quite tremendous change and uncertainty. And, and I think one thing that, I've, just as someone that works in the woods and, and just admires their power and beauty is that um, the history of our forest from glaciation to today is a story of resilience. I mean, it's just amazing how forested Vermont is despite all of our best efforts in the 1800s to kind of eliminate that forest cover. I mean, including having hooved animals pounding on the soil, um, you know, throughout, throughout the landscape. And so, so there's a lot of, I think, that we can learn that we don't necessarily need to be mass engineering the future but at the same time, we're seeing these rates of change, these, these, these novel dynamics like emerald ash borer that just don't have an analog and our forests are just not adapted to doing, to, to respond to those changes that, that are motivating many of us to actually do things and try to find ways to, to address that change. And so a lot of this, this, this talk was about moving things around, planting trees, but I'm also have a lot of hope. This is a gap that was planted in Northern New Hampshire. So you can see American chestnut, um, white pine, black birch, all these were planted but you notice that we're still leaving sugar maple. We're still working with that current forest as well in trying to hopefully harness some of that resilience as part of our solutions um, going forward. So I'll end with that somewhat hopeful, hopeful uh, comment and acknowledge a lot of people that have certainly uh, funded this work over the, over the years um, and, and um, this nice view on the, the Green Mountain National Forest.
I will. Are you seeing um, adaptations? Are any of the trees adapting to the changing climate that you can see yet? Yeah, so the question was, um, so one response to the changing climate is the trees are moving, but there's also, when the trees are present and experiencing that environment, they also can, can adapt, you know, in place. And, and so, you know, there's certainly some work that's shown. That's partly why you don't want to, like, totally harvest all the trees in the forest, because um, as those trees age, um, they can actually have um, genetic mutations and other things that occur that can provide adaptive response. And so um, we haven't been looking directly at the genetics of, of some of the trees that are going out there, but we're now looking at um, basically when they're exposed to stresses, are they, is there kind of a change in their genetic, genetic uh, makeup? And there's a lot of work that suggests that trees exposed to drought early on, trees exposed to some sort of insects and diseases might actually, that might be kind of a priming function that gets them to kind of alter some of their genetics to be more adapted to that. So we're not seeing a ton of that um, in the region. I'm trying to think through, I mean, with some insects and diseases, uh, certain like morphological forms. So uh, we don't worry much about white pine blister rust, um, which was another non-native pathogen introduced. Ironically, it's, it was on talking about planting. Um, when we didn't have much for nurseries in the US, we actually would grow our seedlings in Europe and then bring them back here. And so they think white pine blister rust got to us from Germany on white pine seedlings from the US that they're grown there. Um, and so with that one, where you get to, to the, the western part of its range where it's really lethal, some of the white pine has a much more waxy um, covering on its needles. And it seems like those are less prone to being infested. And so over time, you start seeing more abundance of that, that genotype in the environment. So um, I can't think of any good examples for adaptation that we're observing in Vermont. But, but at the same time, we know it occurs. And so we want to, like that, that inherent resilience piece, we want to make sure that we're um, factoring that in and not just, I think it's, it's well, the key to all this is humility. Um, but I think it's, there's some people that think we're just going to redesign and, and replant the forest of the future. But I think you want to also honor what's out there and, and, and some of those abilities to adapt in place. Um, so it's a great, great point and, and really not something we've looked at directly, but has been observed in a lot of other spots. Yep, great, great observation. Yeah. It, it, the people that do it with this act like it's big. Um, it's, so again, having been around forestry and reforestation, um, what we do, usually we're talking, like the biggest planting we've done is 11,000 trees um, in the Nolhegan Basin. Um, most of that, those familiar with that landscape's history, um, it was before the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service acquired that land. Um, it was owned by Champion Paper, and so very much you know, intensively managed, um, really a large reduction in species diversity. And so a lot of that planting was um, to restore red spruce, white pine to that landscape. Um, and so that, that scale sounds large to some, but those that have been around reforestation, like out in other parts of the country where they plant trees, a, a veteran tree planter could do that in, you know, in six days on their own. Um, but us via college students and, and professors and others, um, you know, it's many weeks of plant, you know, so it's, it, we're, we're slow, but, um, so most of these experiments that we're doing are pretty pretty small, you know, three to 6,000 trees. And, and part of that is not, these are still big experiments, but as I mentioned earlier, it's often, most of the forest we're looking at other ways, we're, we're manipulating um, maybe to create, you know, open areas and thinned areas and kind of diversity of structures that might respond differently to climate change. And then in one location, we're also planting, but we're not doing it everywhere. And so we view it as kind of part of the, the broader toolbox of adaptation. And one that, again, um, you can be proven wrong pretty quickly. Um, and so doing that over large scales and kind, of, and kind of clearing forest to do that is just not something we're, we're advising. But there's, a, again, another, another thing to, to look at called the reforestation hub that the Nature Conservancy um, developed that really looks at parts of the country where there's the potential to add forest for carbon climate mitigation. And so the scales are talking about the, you know, tens of thousands of acres of planting um, to establish new forest as a way to try to kind of offset that. So that, that's a, some pretty big scale planting being talked about. Um, but, but in Vermont, given we don't do much for kind of large scale management to begin with, oftentimes they're kind of finer scale um, operations. They still seem big logistically um, for all of us, that, for those of us that haven't spent much time around um, like the southeast or other parts of the country they do, where they plant you know, millions of trees each year. Um, but, but here, um, it's a, it seems like a lot. Yeah. You mentioned you looked at reforestation in northern Maine, and there was a fair amount. Is that still monoculture for logging? 
Yeah, so um, JD Irving Corporation, uh, so Irving Gas, same, same company based out of New Brunswick. Um, so JD Irving has quite a bit of land up there. Um, historically, they were favoring uh, red spruce, but now they've really shifted to white spruce. Uh, they, they do a lot of tree breeding for um, preferable traits, both in terms of like rapid growth rate, as well as to some degree, um, less vulnerability to spruce budworm. They other plantations, single species. And so um, that's not what we're talking about here. We're, we're, we're trying to think about diversity, kind of, kind of a mix of species across the landscape. And in many cases, those single species situations are what we're trying to move away from, right? That, that's a very vulnerable condition. Um, and, and partly, even one of our challenges as, as a state, if something ever came into Vermont that would, was gonna wipe out maple, like we're in trouble because we have so much, I love the maple we have, but we have so much over so many areas that um, trying to diversify, that's not a bad thing when we think about insects and diseases or climate change impacts. Please, but yeah, the hand over here. I wanted to ask about what happened to the butternut tree because I, as a child, I used to pick butternuts with my grandfather to make, add to the maple candy. I also wanted to ask about where is the uh, nursery in New Hampshire? Yeah, so the, the, the first is the, the butternut tree. So that, um, there's butternut canker, another introduced disease um, has wiped it out. And uh, so butternut, as that, that placard from New Jersey was showing, um, as you mentioned, really the nut, the relative to walnut, it's kind of like the, the, the yin and yang. Um, you know, walnut, quite bitter without, and, and also from a walnut, if you ever try to grow grass beneath it, it has a kind of a, a, has a natural chemicals that releases that kill uh, vegetation. Butternut, very, very rich uh, forest species. Um, we see it occasionally lingering um, in places where there's really good soils, but it's just one or two butternuts. Uh, but those are wiped out by an introduced canker. So there's very, very few butternut left in, 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 the, in the state. And again, culturally, it was so, such an important species just, in, just as a source of food for wildlife, source of food for people. Um, and so it's one of many examples. I mean, the Northeast, um, our history of, of trade um, and the fact that we have like the Port of New York, um, even, you know, the, there's just so much coming in and out every day. And it, all it takes is one pallet that's got a, an insect in it or one um, shipment of plants that's got a disease in it. So global trade has really contributed to just more and more insects and diseases coming into the country. And so butternut canker is an earlier example of one. Chestnut blight, um, many of those that came you know, early on when people were shipping plants around and not really inspecting them or thinking about it. Um, in terms of the, the, the New Hampshire State Nursery, it's down in the Concord um, region, so um, kind of central part of the state. Um, and they're awesome to work with. They've just, I feel like a, we have a, like a, uh, we're friends because we talk every year. We need seedlings for this project, and you're in, and and what we what we find is just you know there's certain things that you don't think of as being limiting, but um, there's only so many people that are cone collectors anymore that collect cones. Uh, only so many people that go out and collect acorns, and so even the ability to grow seed seedlings, the first step is having enough seed. Um, and so there's some concern over even losing that, but but they have been growing their capacity, and they're just seeing a lot more people wanting to plant. Um, COVID was part of it because people just wanted to do something. But beyond that, now people are just getting more and more interested. And there's a lot of stories in the news. State of Maryland, state of Virginia is asking, send us your acorns. Or look, you know, there's just a lot of interest in, in growing seedlings. But um, the first step is getting seed and, and getting seed from the right spots. But they're great to work with. They, they, used, to, they used to get their catalog right around Thanksgiving. Now it's online. Um, just, last, just started last year. So right around November, if you want to order um, some, some exports from New Hampshire, that's, a, that's an option. Yeah. Um, so for those of us that are on the land use plan, I'm wondering about the communication about all of these initiatives to the foresters who then talk to us, the property owners, and can we include it in our land use plan? Yeah, so a couple things. One, um, NRCS, so the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which provides a lot of cost share assistance to landowners, um, they are now including, you know, planting. Um, it used to be very much focused on riparian areas, but now it's also including upland plantings. Uh, the, there's a lot of money flowing through, um, I think it's through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, going to private landowners to do climate smart forest management. And that includes uh, things like planting for adaptation. So um, if you're working with a consulting forester and they're not aware of those programs, it might be worth bringing them up. But, but many, and actually um, Red Start Forestry, it's a great group of foresters out of Corinth. Um, 
they are now actually have established their own nursery because they're recognizing there's not enough seedlings for these projects. And so they're starting to grow their own nursery, their own seedlings for projects. So there are definitely some consultants that are, that are well aware of it. And, um, and we do a lot of outreach and training, you know, around like just, just strategies for dealing with change. And there's often a lot of interest in just thinking about if we're going to plant, where do we get the trees and, and how do we do that? So, but I, I would, I would definitely endorse that. I mean, I, they're, they're UVM forestry alums, so that's a good thing, but, um, they're also very thoughtful and proactive on these changes and, and including um, they just received some grants to build, kind of create their own nursery in Corinth to be growing seedlings for some projects with landowners. And who is that? Uh, Red Start Forestry. Red Start. Yeah, Ben, ben Machin, um, M-A-C-H-I-N, um, is one of the foresters that, that runs, runs the company. Yeah. How has past legislation affected all this stuff? Future legislation is yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest ones is the nursery piece. And, and the challenge, again, actually to Red Start's credit, um, starting your own nursery is a risky proposition. And, and, and you know, basically you're, you're planting something that you're assuming there's going to be demand for. And what that's created over time is often most nurseries will grow what they know people will buy. So red oak, white pine. Um, but a lot of what we talk about sometimes, like a good example would be uh, like wetlands that are threatened by emerald ash borer. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in using silver maple or swamp white oak. Those species were, aren't commonly produced at a nursery because you know, there just hasn't historically been a lot of demand there. And so providing some of that cost share assistance or even you know, they can't kick out the soccer fields or the, the, or the, the offices in Essex, but um, if the state's serious about a lot of the work they're trying to do both with riparian reforestation, but also more broadly, I think there's, there's a need for more investment in that. Um, and just in terms of nursery capacity, I say the state of Vermont writ large, the, the, we're the first state to have a climate forester. So as a state, we're pretty darn progressive in terms of thinking about um, adaptation. And actually we're the first state to have a formal policy in assisted migration. So they, they do have um, a lot of thinking going in around this. The challenge is that that policy is pretty strict in terms of where you get seeds from and seedlings from. And so I don't think it fully recognized that it's not as easy. You can't just go to Walmart and pull off the shelf. I want like the Southern seed zone for Red Oak or the Windsor County Red Oaks. So, that, so I think there's some logistical hurdles. Um, and then also just, it, I'm hoping this uh, climate conservation service they're talking about, um, part of it will be just getting, labor is a huge shortage too, right? Just getting people out there to do this work. Um, so I think just policies like that can be important. But the biggest one is trying to keep forest forest. I, I'd say if I, if, I, if I had like one chit to play in a state house, it'd be that we, we're losing forest land as a state um, we're losing large forest blocks because we're, we're still allowing houses to be thrown in the middle of like 500 acre chunks of woods. And so forest fragmentation and forest loss, I mean, I, I'm talking a lot about trying, and this is a good example, Green Mountain National Forest, we're super lucky, that's conserved. I mean, there's no risk of there being a house put here. Um, and so we can think about how to manage creatively, but once this is a house or a solar array, we've kind of lost that like incredible natural climate solution, that, that incredible fabric. And, and I think there's not enough attention being paid right now. I mean, because the, there's been a bill in the legislature for a long time now on trying to, you know, modify uh, building and zoning to, to minimize fragmentation. And it hasn't gotten, you know, the governor's been vetoing that. So I think that to me would be the one, the one shit I'd play, you know, independent of seedlings and nurseries. It's just like keep forest forest. I mean, that's so, so important to all of us. And globally, it's so important. I mean, we are an important part of the carbon budget. So keeping it, keeping it wooded is critical. Yeah. Between 16 and 17 feet, which has a lot of beach, all beach park disease. What is the most likely succession? Yeah, and so, so just to repeat the question, so she's got an area that's got a lot of beach park disease, and I think most of us are familiar with um, beach park disease. I don't want to get you dizzy going backwards here, but I can give you a picture of a, a really challenging spot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm bringing back all these bad memories. All right, almost there we go. So this is, uh, you're not gonna see it now. This is an area that they, oop, it's really bad. Uh, so this is an area, you can't see it very well, but this is all beach uh, suckers and then there's like declining beach in the overstory. So beach bark disease, another non-native scale insect. So the, 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 the disease part is a, is a native canker, Nectria. But the scale that causes the wound in the beech tree that then allows it to have the, the disease is actually was introduced. And unlike most introductions that happened to the south of us, um, this one actually happened in Nova Scotia in the late 1800s and then moved its way. And so if you, if you 
grew up in Maine or um, went to Maine and said, what is that tree that looks crazy with like shotgun marks in it? Um, it's, it's probably most severe there because it's been there longest. Um, and if, you're, if you've spent time in southern New England, like I grew up in Massachusetts, like I mentioned, I still remember these big beach that were smooth, looked like elephant legs, you know, and so beach bark disease hadn't quite gotten there yet. So in Vermont, it got here in the 50s and 60s. Um, and what it largely does, again, recognize many of you are aware of this and what she's describing, is it stresses the overstory beach. Um, it causes them to root sprout, so send up um, sprouts from the root system. And then beach is extremely tolerant of shade. It's actually the most shot, uh, shade tolerant hardwood species. And so it can kind of develop these thickets of beach beneath it. And so when we think about climate change and climate change impacts on beach, um, you know, usually the way I, I interpret projections for beach is that this is one tough species that's hard to like see moving and, and, and leaving. And so a lot of these places will continue to be just sprout origin beach. The real concern I have right now, and I mentioned this a minute ago, and I don't want to make this all about gloom and doom, um, but there is a new, they call it a, a disease affecting beach called beach leaf disease. It's starting to make its way into the popular press. Um, it's primarily been in Connecticut, Pennsylvania. Um, it's unclear, it was, it was unclear initially what was causing it, but I think it's actually a nematode um, that's affecting the beach and it causes the, the leaves to look all crinkled up. This was the worst year to look for it because of that, that late season frost we had. Every beach looked like it had beach leaf disease after that frost. Um, but that one has me worried. Um, and again, beach, most foresters, we get annoyed with beach because it does this. Um, we want other species to grow back. But beach is so important, as I mentioned, ecologically. If we lose beach, that's a real problem for a lot of our wildlife um, on the landscape. And so in those areas, you know, it's, oftentimes in those sites, they tend to be pretty good sites for yellow birch, other species, but you need to basically you know, do a harvest that kind of eliminates the beach to get those back. And so if you're just looking at that area naturally changing, it's gonna stay beach um, until something really, um, if beach leaf disease gets there, it might change. But this is a pretty darn resilient species, which is a, 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 a curse to, to, to foresters because they want other stuff to come back in those spots. But if you're just concerned about, is it gonna change other species? Beach is, beach is pretty darn tough. It's gonna keep re-sprouting and, and be there um, on that site for a long time. Yeah. <coughs> We read all the smoke from the Canadian fires all summer, and this is a little out of your area, but it's close. I'm curious about, we heard about all the thousands of acres that burned, and I assume they were sort of one species, but what, what should happen now? Yeah, so the question was about, again, it, it's interesting. Uh, UVM, is, as many of you know, we, we have students from, a lot of students from out of state that come, and, and actually increasingly a lot of students from California. Um, and so I teach about forests and, and, and talk about forest fires. And uh, it's been useful to kind of call on those students to have them share their experience. Um, like how many had their fall sports seasons canceled because of air quality. So in many cases, it was a little bit interesting for all of us. I mean, it stunk, but it's like this is, you know, just puts in perspective what the West deals with a lot now with these air quality issues because of wildfire. I mean, it's just a, um, even what we had was a, was a drop in the bucket. So I'm not, not trying to diminish it, but just to put it in perspective, just, just to the, the, the impacts of climate change on people's um, well-being. And so those areas that are burning uh, in northern, uh, some of them were in Alberta, some were, I mean, it's the largest fire year on record for Canada. So I mean, it's, I can pick in any province and it was a big fire year. But if we, if we look at Quebec, which often is we do see some smoke from Quebec wildfires, you know, oftentimes it might be a hazier view certain days during the summer. Um, so most of those are arboreal uh, black spruce uh, forests. So, they are pretty uh, monospecific. Some of that is natural. So black spruce is a species um, that it has cones that are what we call semi serotonous So they actually stay somewhat shut um, with like, a, like a, a resin. And when they're burned, they open. So it's kind of a natural adaptation to recolonizing similar to jack pine or lodgepole pine. So those forests are, are naturally built to burn. That's kind of what they do. But what we do is we create lots of areas that look just like that kind of uniform fuels and again, kind of to go back to um, you know, indigenous stewardship, there's a lot of discussion about um, use of fire by First Nations people historically in that boreal region and how it almost was used as a way to provide um, buffers and safety from those. So that often would encourage hardwood species, less flammable species around where they were and would kind of break up that like giant monolith of, of flammable forest. And so those definitely were forests that naturally would burn, but the scales they burned at were both a, a function of climate change, just warmer, drier conditions, but also 
a function of what we do to the land, which is often create homogeneity over large areas that are just very prone to, to big scale disturbances. So the Western US is a huge issue, you know, in general. Um, we can't, I know it was suggested by someone that we can rake the forest, that's not, we can't rake enough uh, to, to, to fix that. Um, or, or even, but even like forest management, you know, you're, we, we, we know we should be thinning and you know, reducing fuels, but it's such a, the, the magnitude of what needs to be impacted is so great that, you know, it's just, just, just impossible to tackle. And so a lot of the emphasis of the government on like funding nurseries is because they know we're gonna have these big fire events. How do we go back out there and reforest? And I would implore them to reforest in ways that don't set it up for a future fire. So trying to make sure there's still mixes of species, um, you know, lower densities in places so the fire can kind of work through and not crown out. Um, and so it's not going away. I, I don't think of Vermont as a, like, we're very lucky that we're at most, we just, our forests aren't really built to burn. Um, you know, the, the, the hard, you, you're gonna call me next year after the big Vermont fire year. I know I did not that I said it, but, um, you know, we've had fires and again, even Maine, you know, 1947, the year that Maine burned, it still was, you know, there, there's definitely, you know, fires occur, but, um, you know, compared to the West, we are so lucky. And that's kind of why I brought up the keeping forest forest piece. We look at carbon, you know, and the ability even to, to like harvest trees sustainably um, here, like things grow bad. I mean, we were so wet, you know, again, not to, to, to belabor that point this, this year, whereas out West, it's pretty, pretty scary, you know, what's going on out there. You know, they're on some thresholds that they might not have forests in places in the future. And so we, we should be really, I think, um, you know, really taking care of just how great this resource is here and thinking about how to, how to, how to manage that and conserve it in the future. Yeah, good. yeah sure. Encourage of leaving slash behind, encourage fires. It, it would if we lived somewhere else. Uh, but here it's actually, and, that, and that's always, a, it's, a, it's great you bring this up. So uh, the, the, the question was about current use. Again, Vermont's um, use value appraisal program, which is very important, obviously, to, to reduce taxes that people are paying on forest land. Um, and so the question is, you know, that it, it actually asks landowners to leave behind slash and dead wood. And that's really, you know, to, you know, to me as a, as a forest ecologist and, and just scientist, I love dead wood. You know, it's such a big part of the forest. And, and, and actually, um, if you look at the, re, the, the writings of Leopold and others, when they first went over to, when we first went over to Europe, that he was just blown away by like, there's no wood in the forest. Everything's been kind of manicured and pulled out. Um, and so our forests naturally have a lot of dead, dead things in them. And we talk about a healthy forest. Um, Oftentimes you say, well, this is unhealthy, all the trees are dead. But if you're a, a species that requires dead wood, it's actually a very healthy, yeah, it's a very healthy spot. Um, so our, our forests naturally, like we have windstorms, other things that, that have, have um, dead wood in them. And so our forests are naturally messy. And, and so it's more of our psychology, like to your point, especially after logging, there's a lot of residue and slash that's left out on the site. But that slash has you know, a lot of important functions. Uh, critically, uh, if we look at this, this is a pitch pine here that's been killed by Southern pine beetle, um, which uh, is, is kind of spread north with climate change. In this tree, most of the nutrients, kind of the highest nutrients in this tree actually are in the branch wood, in the small, small twigs. Because the, the bowl of the tree really is that bark and the cambium, the outer part that has most of the concentrations of nutrients, right? The inner part of the tree is just dead, it's dead, you know, dead tissue. There's not any nutrients stored there. So these, these parts of the tree per capita have a lot of nutrients in them. And so if we're, we want to leave that if we can on the site, so that can go back in the soil. At the same time, there's a lot of wildlife that requires slash, and so it's a good, and, and also this summer, if you were logging, good, good luck, but if you were logging, um, that slash can be really important also to kind of cushion the equipment. So we're, we're seeing a lot of loggers getting into uh, machinery that actually delim, delims the trees and kind of makes a cushion to, to go on. Um, so, so there's a lot of good reasons to do it, I, but I think there's, there's definitely like a tradition around we want the woods neat and clean, um, but, but ecologically, yeah, it, it, it's a good thing. So current use is spot on with, with that recommendation, and um, it's part of even during a drought, which wasn't this year, those spots can be really important for retaining moisture, so good spots for seedlings, salamanders, other stuff that needs that. So, um, so I, 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 I vote for, for dead wood, but that's my own. Maybe, maybe not at the university, but in the, in the woods, definitely. <laughs> Be too much there. Thank you so much.
very, very much. Um, may I remind all of you that we have uh, another program a week from today on um, the 251 Club in Vermont uh, that um, encourages people to visit all of the towns and, and cities in Vermont. We'd love to see you back. Um, and please leave your name tag with us as you walk out. And thank you for coming. <laughs>